Hello, I am Lisa McCune and I'm here with Neil Rutherford, Blake Bowden and Ross Hannaford to talk about the upcoming world premiere of Beyond Desire, which premieres at the Hayes Theatre in Sydney later this year. Neil, you are directing and producing the show. With your writer's hat on, why the title and what is the story about? Uh, well, Beyond Desire came up when uh, my partner and I were walking around a mountain in Greece, actually, and we were trying to find a title. We come up with Will to Kill, which we thought was really <laughs> dreadful. <laughs> and I said, we can't use that, an exclamation mark. Mm -hmm. So Beyond Desire, um, honestly, we literally said we're not going to go home until we found the title. And uh, Beyond Desire came up because all of the characters in the show, they all have a desire for something, but it goes further than that, so they get what they want and then it's what happens thereafter, so, mm -hmm. so uh, it's in quite apt. And the, and the story is really based on, um, it's based on two things, um, Shakespeare's Hamlet, which I'd studied at school, and uh, you know, it's classic, it's incredible sort of psychological mm -hmm. family drama. And then Morris, which for me as a, as a teenager coming out, I'd read Morris, the novel, which was so beautiful and so important in my life, and then I saw all the Merchant Ivory movies that were out there, so Room with a View, all Ian Forster. And then Morris, and it was really, it was a very, very sort of life-changing mm. moment for me. We, I think we've all got stories of, of moments in our lives when we see something. Mm. And then that, that really had a, a massive impact, and I wanted to write the musical Morris. And then I thought, well, no, let's be clever, let's try and combine the two. And what actually attracted you to the period? I kind of, you know, we, I think we all associate with, with a period of time that we wish we'd have been born in, or mm. for any of us who believe that we might have had another life what was the last one, and I, I kind of always felt Edwardian feeling, I kind of liked the idea of it. Um, but also my, my the very first musical I directed was a musical about Oscar Wilde. So all of the research, I was like 20, and all of the research that I did there, as always, I found it fascinating. And of course what was different with the Edwardian period, that just had the huge reign of Victoria, which was very, very stoic and sort of quite hard in terms of, in terms of what, what society was about. And then Edward, the seventh was a, was effectively a playboy, so everything mm -hmm. started to relax. We were only ten years away from the Roaring Twenties when all kinds of things were happening. So mm -hmm. it was a very it was a really big change of period, and I, I think we've tried to capture that within in terms of the relationship with the two mm -hmm. boys. We've tried to capture the change of f this very stern Victorian period going into the Edwardian and this relaxation of, of morals, I suppose, but but also just the way that people began to think in a slightly different way to the, to the slightly draconian way that they'd been thinking before. Mm. When was it written? Well, in truth, there's a song that Blake sings which was written pretty much 25 years ago when I was at university wow. with Kieran. So that was, that was um, Is It All Worth It, which, which comes in the first act. So that was, the, that was the very first song that was written. And that was then going to be for the musical Morris that we wanted to do. Um, but then as the shows progressed, and of course the problem is we're all busy, you know, I mean, I was very lucky to have a, since then, had a, had a, you know, a wonderful acting career to speak of, and then, and then working for Ambassador Theatre Group was full time and never a moment's rest. Um, and then I think, you know, something happens to you when I was 40, I thought, hang on, there's got to be more to my life, you know, and giving up an amazing job in London. Mm. Um, that, was, that was kind of hard, but actually has allowed me to actually finish the piece, mm. and, and here we are, we're putting it on. You've worked all over the world extensively uh, in London, and why now in Australia, and why at the Hayes? Well, the, the now is because I think of all those things, that, you know, that, that change in, in my direction of, of life, and coming to Australia to, do, to, to work with you guys, with Opera Australia, with John Frost, it's been an incredible sort of milestone in my life and one that I'm mean, so, so grateful and so excited about having done. Mm. So that makes it Australia. Um, and I love the talent here. I've always said the talent here is as good as anything mm. around the world where I've worked, and I'm really proud of that, and I'm proud to be working with you and, and, and everybody that we've, we've worked with. It's very, very strong. So there's no reason why it shouldn't be here than any other, any other place. And the, and the sort of now in time was really, it was slightly by accident. We were, we were in Studio 9 with David Campbell's morning show filming a little segment of Wash That Man and in between all the breaks I had a chat with David and of course I remember David and his wife Lisa from London and I said you know you're missing performing because you've got this regular morning show going on and, uh, and he said well uh, you know I, I am but I've got this little project I'm, I'm sort of opening a little theatre with some other mates in, in Potts Point 
and uh, you, do you know of anyone who's got some material? We're going to be looking for new small scale shows. And I sort of fell over and went, right, here we go. <laughs> um, Neil, you're talking about having the perfect cast, and indeed it is very special. You have Chloe Dallymore, Christy Sullivan, uh, David Balters, and of course the incredible legend that is Nancy Hayes in her own theatre. It's something of a coup. Yes, when, we announced, when we announced yesterday, uh, apparently the, the whole internet went a bit bonkers with Nancy <laughs> being there. <laughs> so, Amazing. fantastic. And you also have the two handsome chaps sitting next to you, Blake Bowden and uh, Ross Hannaford. Blake, you're playing Anthony, and Ross, uh, you play James. Blake, can you tell us a little bit about your character, Anthony? Uh, Anthony is um, he's a young guy who's just finished university and he's kind of gone off, as many young people do, on this incredible overseas adventure and he's kind of, I guess, starting to explore himself and kind of find out who he really is, away from the pressures of school, away from the pressures of home. Um, and then this terrible tragedy happens. He loses his father really unexpectedly. And so he's kind of brought back into that life, that home life. and. Things unfold there that he doesn't expect, such as his mother marrying his father's business partner. And so he has all these questions surrounding the death and surrounding basically what his family is up to. Blake, you've created several original characters in new works, um, such as Cat Stevens' musical Moon Shadow, as well as your own show based on the life of Mario Lanza. Um, so how does your approach as an actor differ from, from originating a role, um, as opposed to, say, playing Lieutenant Cape in the South Pacific? I think that when a role is pre-existing, I think that there's a certain amount of expectation that comes with the role. Mm -hmm. And that can be stifling, but it can actually also be really freeing sometimes because mm -hmm. there seems to be a framework in which you approach the role from when it's set up, such as um, mm -hmm. in South Pacific. But when you're creating a new role like this, there is a kind of abandon in bringing what you can and all of your natural innate eccentric eccentricities to a role but there's also something scary about that too mm. because there is no framework and there is no kind of guide to well this is kind of where the role sits inside the piece and so not only are you in a rehearsal process not only are you learning the lines and learning the music and developing you know, your relationships with your fellow actors, mm. but you're also kind of having to discover the character as well, like from, mm. you know, from a very fresh starting point. For you, Ross, tell us about your character, James. Uh, James is, same as Anthony, a recent college graduate, young, well-educated, mm. comes from a wealthy background, I think. I think uh, with it being set in 1910, there's certain social norms that um, were prevalent at that time, mm. you know, acting the right way and saying the right thing and, and dressing the correct way and I think my character does that very well. He sort of succeeds at riding that social wave really well but underneath I, I get the impression that there's this bubbling desire for adventure and to really explore mm. the world and and try something different. James has uh, secret feelings for Blake's character at a time when it was very difficult to speak about such a love. How does that secrecy manifest itself in your role? Well, I mean, dealing with that sort of, um, those issues are really difficult even in this day and age, so mm. I can't even really imagine what it would have been like back in the early 1900s. Um, I imagine you must have felt really scared and, and vulnerable and, and not really willing to express those ideas. Um, but it sort of feeds into what I was discussing about his character. I think he really he knows where it's the right time to, to go with those issues and where it isn't. And he, he knows how to sort of successfully navigate yeah. um, you know, his friends and family. But um, I think he is really longing for you know, something else, you know, okay. a, a new way of living. Yeah, I think it's interesting as well because um, in the research I've done so far, in that time, actually, men at college were actually far more physically comfortable with each other, for mm. example. Um, and I guess going to boarding school and living in dorm rooms and um, living in shared quarters at university as well, there actually is a different relationship that they had to each other. Mm. And so I think that coupled with these extra feelings are kind of are highly confusing for these young mm. men because mm. the, re the relationship is so intimate and so physical, yet 
for them there's another layer to it. Mm. Neil, back to you, in the text and music, have you kept a sense of the period? Um, well, certainly within the music, um, Kieran's been very, very clear about um, giving it both a contemporary musical theatre style, mm -hmm. but also lots of references to Elgar, Debussy, Percy Granger, mm -hmm. Ravel. So there's all these kind of, I mean, there's a, there's a song that the boys sing in Act Two, beginning at the opening of Act Two, which is the, the old school song of the university they've been at. And that's basically a, a reworking of an Ed, Ed, Elgar, Edward Elgar mm -hmm. piece. I mean, it's almost can fit on top of it. But it's there on purpose to suggest the style, and, mm. and then in the in the dialogue, in the language, um, you know, there's lots of non-contractions, can't become, cannot, sort of all of that kind of stuff, just to give it a slight sense. But but with the younger characters, we have contracted, so that sort of suggests the future of where language might go. So it's yes. you've got old yes. world and and new world language. Um, coming backwards and forwards. Are you continuing? Uh, is, is the piece evolving or have you locked it down now? Um, kind of <laughs> it down now? No, I mean it can't be locked down, it's the first time we're doing yeah. it. We have a very short rehearsal period so yeah. inevitably that will slightly challenge mm. how much time we can be flexible. Mm. Um, but we've had we've had lots of readings and, uh, and two workshops as well. Oh, so we're, we're kind of ahead. For you Ross, you were recently in a huge show, King Kong. Uh, what are the differences in playing in a production of that scale and sized auditorium as opposed to the steady intimacy of the Hayes Theatre? Well, King Kong was huge. Mm. Oh my gosh, <laughs> the beast was huge. I mean, we had a cast of almost 50 people. It was, you know, outrageous. But it sat so well in the Regent Theatre. Mm. It sort of required such a big space and it was perfect for it. And But I think the point of difference that the Hayes Theatre has, I mean, it's got to be intimacy in that you you feel like you're in the room with the characters and, and you know, perhaps if somebody's crying, you know, you'll see the tear or if somebody's trembling, you know, you'll feel it and it will really hit you and I think that that's a really special thing about, about what we do and um, it can hit you harder and therefore make you think a little more, which is, you know, yeah. sort of why we do what we do. Um, I'm the audience, I've come to see your show. What, what, am, what am I going to um, experience? What, what, are some of the, what, are the, what are some of the emotions that I, that I might get from this night? Am I, am I going to laugh? Am I going to go on a journey with these characters yeah. and cry? Yeah, but I, I certainly think you'll laugh. I mean, uh, although mm -hmm. it's a murder mystery and it does get very dark in some places, mm -hmm. there's, some, there's some really sort of torturous moments for all of the characters. Um, but, uh, but certainly, with the, mainly with the aid of Nancy's character, there's a lot of fun in there as well, a lot of mistaken sort of moments where she thinks one thing and actually it's completely the other. So I think we've got to, you know, that's part of the structure thing we talked about earlier. Mm. You know, you build in you build in levels of comedy in the same way with King and I, we have a we have a great moment of shall we dance and then we have the whipping scene. You know, they contrast each other and they actually help each other. So all the way through the all the way through good musicals that, that, that structure's there. Mm. So I've tried to replicate that. But um, you know, I hope I hope um, you know every family has secrets, mm. and uh, I hope there's a moral of the story that actually sometimes we need to share them rather than bottle them up. If there's a if there's something to take away, I think that might be it. Oh, <laughs> that's brilliant. Well, thank you to Neil, Ross, and Blake, and I hope that that has given you uh, a glimpse of the new musical Beyond Desire. The show opens on the twenty first of November at the Hayes Theatre in Sydney. Um, I know that I actually can't wait to see it. I'm Lisa McCune and thank you very much for tuning in.